We have to make sure that the politicians are held accountable. Every administration had the ability to put a ban on asbestos. When it comes to asbestos, it really is about power, money, uh, and politics. Our next speaker is Mark Catlin, and I just want to give a shout out. Both Mark and I are active members of the American Public Health Association. Mark. Thank Good. Thank you to ADO and to Linda for the invitation to speak. This is the most inspiring conference I attend every year, and so I want to thank all of you for being here and being a part of that and, and helping many of us go on and continue to do this work. Um, like many other occupational health and safety folks in the early to mid nine, er, early to mid eighties, we began becoming involved in training workers to to handle asbestos, to remove asbestos, as laws and regulations were were moving in that direction. So when I first started teaching, a lot of it were construction and maintenance workers, but they were workers who had installed the asbestos products in their earlier in their career. Now we were teaching them how to take them out properly. And so they had a good sense of like a lot of the history that Tony just described. Um, but by the mid 90s, what we started to see was a lot of the people that we were teaching had no concept of the history of asbestos. And the question I would start to get would be, why is this everywhere? Like when we teach classes, why is it in so many products? So to answer their question, I thought, well, it'd be interesting to make the classes more fun to find old historical films that must be out there about the promotion of asbestos by the industry and others, and, and to incorporate that into the class. And so I did that, and the students really seemed to respond well. So if you're an instructor and your students like something, as I was told earlier on, do more of that. And so I did. I kept looking for old films. Then when YouTube showed up, decade or more ago, I ended up accidentally having a YouTube channel. So I have this collection of health and safety films, a lot of which involve asbestos from my earlier training time. And I want to show you some clips of those in the next few minutes and also sort of talk about ways they could be used. Okay, so, um, so I sort of broke them down into three areas and I have three short clips. So first is, is the sort of films about promoting asbestos that go back before 1970, where the hazard of asbestos is never mentioned in any of the films that I found. Uh, then the second phase is the sort of hazard of asbestos becoming more, more well known in training films and others being developed. And then the final phase, sort of, first final phase was sort of the uh, preventing exposure to workers and others uh, through training, through uh, educational materials. And I, and I take that up until the 1990s, because really by the, Late 1990s, you know, the idea that asbestos was not an issue anymore, that it was gone, was kind of the common frame. And until really ADO helped to kick that back in again in the early 2000s, and now we're back in this kind of second phase of trying to get rid of this stuff and prevent worker exposures, you know, things seem to peter out. So I'm going to show you these three areas, and these are all these are all what I call tw they're, they're, uh, 20th century films. So they're when we actually had films and videos and not digital. And so, so it turns out that. In around 1920, the U.S. Bureau of Mines decided to embark on an educational campaign to promote U.S. industry um, by using a new technology called motion pictures. And they started for about 50 years, they started a film series uh, pushing American industry and American technology. One of the first films that they produced was this, was this film over on the far left, Story of Asbestos, with the assistance of John Mansfield. And, and then there are others. So, in 1959, they did another film called Asbestos, A Matter of Time, also assisted by Johns Mansville, and I'm gonna show you a clip from that here. What do you do with the fiber when you get it? How does it contribute to better living? How does it enhance our daily lives? Let's start with our homes. The attractive roof, which protects us against fire and weather, will never rot or decay because the shingles are made of asbestos and cement. Cement could not do the job alone. A cement shingle would break easily without the reinforcing qualities of asbestos. But when asbestos fibers are added, it becomes strong and tough, amazingly so. Strong enough and tough enough so that it can even be made into large, flexible sheets like these. When these 
These fireproof sheets of asbestos and cement are used as the exterior wall finish of our homes. We enjoy the permanence of stone combined with the beauty of vertical accent, so desirable in contemporary architecture. Asbestos helps beautify the home with colorful vinyl asbestos floor tile. Tough asbestos fiber protects them against wear. In the cords of household appliances that demand heavy amounts of electricity, asbestos provides protective insulation. And no matter how long little Johnny plays with his electric train, asbestos insulation in the transformer offers similar protection. And when drinking water comes out sparkling clear, an asbestos cement pipe may have helped guard it from reservoir to home. Water mains of white asbestos cement pipe cannot rust. Since this pipe is corrosion resistant throughout, its smooth interior stays smooth. Asbestos cement pipe also provides a health line in carrying off waste from our homes to the street sewer. It is strong, long-lasting, and economical. So they were official U.S. Bureau of Mine films, but they were done by the, the industry. Um, and I remember playing with that Lionel train with that asbestos insulated transformer when I was a kid. So, so in, in none of those films that I found, and uh, were there ever any mention of the dangers of asbestos or any warnings, it was simply the promotion of the product. So, so we get into the second phase of where we started to see asbestos becoming uh, recognized as a hazard. Years ago, official studies found no evidence linking asbestos to the health hazards encountered by those exposed to it. But a pulmonary specialist from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City knew it couldn't be mere coincidence that workers who breathed in the fibers developed lung disease in disproportionate numbers compared to the population at large. To use his science to prove later to prevent this dreaded disease. This became the life work of Dr. Irving J. Selikoff. Using the methods he learned from his work with tuberculosis, Dr. Selikoff began to explore the occupational dangers of exposure to asbestos in 1953. By 1962, he had amassed enough evidence to suggest such a link. He then contacted the Asbestos Workers Union. The asbestos workers welcomed the doctor's inquiry as they had long suspected the link. Asbestos is one hazard that we've known about for some time. And really given good. sufficient really exposure, this brings on a number of crippling That's lung diseases. Good morning. I'm Doug Constable, I'm We're beginning today a national campaign to help state and local officials prevent the exposure of children to hazardous asbestos-containing materials that are present in some schools. The danger to school children depends in large measure on the condition of the asbestos-containing material and the degree of deterioration or flaking. The more fibers being released into the air, the greater the hazard. At present, the extent to which asbestos-containing materials exist in the nation's schools and other buildings is uncertain. These materials were commonly applied to ceilings, walls, and other areas of buildings built between 1946 and 1973. Those are wondering why I've asked you here. As a matter of fact, I'm starting to wonder what I'm doing here. As a matter of fact, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. When I got to school today, I got some welcome. Mr. Woodman calls me into his office. He says, Cotter, I want you to make sure that this worker who's fixing the ceiling doesn't get asbestos all over the place before the kids come back from lunch. So if you're of a certain age, you recognize the star of Welcome Back Cotter that was so popular. So they used it to train school administrators and school workers about the early dangers of asbestos back in the late 1970s. So, so some sort of interesting historical pieces. Um, so we get into the third phase, and that's really when I began my work in 1980, was really when we started to look at more prevention and protection training of workers. 
um, on asbestos. And uh, many of the films were from EPA, but also OSHA, NIOSH, and, and then lots of private organizations as, as they could sell products into the training world. Um, what I want to show here is a film from my own union on an on a example of solving an asbestos problem that is still relevant today. They were mechanics for the most part, who worked on the fleet of state trucks, snow blowers, cars, payloaders. Some were brake mechanics who'd been exposed to airborne asbestos dust blown out of old brake drums. A lot of people that have worked uh, in, the, in the department here, especially in the garage for the last, say, 20 years, that have been doing the same, same brake and clutch work, and they never realized the, the problems with asbestos. Alarmed about this practice, union leaders Joe McKay and John Mullen convinced their employer to hold education sessions about the hazards of asbestos. Many people don't act on the, set, the hazards they face at work because they either believe it's always been that way and it always will be that way, or they think there's no safer way to do the job. Schrag discussed encapsulating equipment on the market that completely encloses the brake drum and through a vacuum sucks the asbestos dust into airtight containers, preventing the escape of tiny, dangerous fibers. And when they realized that they didn't have the proper equipment, the proper masks, the proper encapsulating machines, they just stopped. And, and this happened all across the state. Almost one garage after another stopped doing this. They virtually put down their tools. The work stoppage succeeded. It had the support of some middle-level managers who were alarmed themselves after learning of the long-term damage asbestos can have on the lungs. The Labor Management Committee met again and came up with a plan. And within six months, the encapsulating machines were installed. Our members, by taking direct action, created a crisis that management had to solve. And they solved it. And in six months, those machines were delivered. That's pretty unheard of when it comes to state bureaucracies to move that fast. So that's an example from our union to deal with asbestos exposure to our members in 1988. So 30 years later, this is a common story that we still see and we're still having a lot of these same fights. So the real need to ban asbestos products is certainly there and to help us you know, down the road to stop this issue, but then the dealing with the legacy asbestos is gonna be something that's gonna be around for a, a long time. You know, with asbestos out of brake shoes, these members are, would be protected, but we represent lots of, of building maintenance workers and school workers and others who would continue to be exposed to the legacy asbestos. So when I think about this historical films, other than, you know, I, I found them sort of fascinating as a uh, health and safety professional. So I think that, but I think that there's a lot of value and we've used them in both education and training, but also in, in campaigns that we've worked on. And I think there's ways for us to think about how to use this in, uh, in both the attempt to ban asbestos in the U.S. And, and other countries around the world, but also to protect workers and and consumers and, and others from asbestos exposure. And these films are primarily um, uh, available for free. They're mostly in the public domain and they're available on this resource that's on YouTube that I've created and maintained. So I invite you to take a look at this. Uh, there's a URL and to consider if these, this, these might be both useful in education training campaigns that you're working on. And I'd be happy to sort of tell you more about these, help you get access to the films and, and help in other ways that I can share the experience we have in using them. So uh, there's my contact information. So thank you so much for what everybody's doing and thanks for your time.